All right. Hello, everybody. This is Mary Lou Ford. I'm the Executive Director of the Open Education Consortium. I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me. Great. So we are expecting more people to join us, but I imagine they'll be dropping in uh, in the next few minutes. There is uh, There are some buttons on the top of the screen. You can see one with a hand raised if you would like a microphone or would like to speak, please go ahead and raise your hand. We'll be happy to call on you. You can also use the chat box to ask questions at any time, add a comment, uh, whatever you like. We're very happy to see you all um, in the meeting today for our community meeting. Uh, an opportunity for us to really uh, interact with you, to let you know things that we're up to, to hear things that you're up to, and to have some discussions around topics that are facing the open education community. So we're going to go ahead and just uh, get started. Our agenda today is to look at Open Education Week. We're also going to, to show you our 2015 year in review of activities from the Open Education Consortium. We have two guests here to speak about projects that they're working on, so we'll hear some highlights from community members there. We want to have a discussion around what we should be doing for the Cape Town Declaration to mark its 10-year anniversary. We'll tell you a little more about our Open Education Awards for Excellence, and then we will leave time for questions, comments, or any additional discussion items that you have. So jumping right into Open Education Week, uh, if you have not yet seen the website, it's openeducationweek.org. This, this year's Open Education Week is March 7th through 11th. We did send out a survey last uh, summer to people to ask what the best dates for Open Education Week were, and the overwhelming response was to keep it the second week of March. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, the call for participation is now open, and we hope that you are considering what you're going to do for Open Education Week. It's really easy to tell us. And once you do tell us, it'll appear on the website. It'll appear on the calendar of events. Uh, if you send us a video, that goes right onto the home page, links to it. And we also will send you this lovely little badge that you see on this slide. Um, so that you can put that on your website or on any promotional materials you have to let people know that you're being featured in Open Education Week. And we'd love your help to uh, let other people know that the call for participation is open. Anybody can submit. The only criteria is that it has to do with open education and that it is an openly licensed event or, or promotion or website or webinar. Um, we also want to make sure that you're aware of the downloads that are available. We have some really great graphic materials to help you promote Open Education Week, things like PowerPoint presentation templates. Uh, we have posters, we have logos, and we have these great web banners. And they're all right there on the website right now. Just go ahead, grab them, put them wherever you like, and help us get the word out to spread the news about Open Education. We also have a fun social event. That we're, uh, that we're running to try to promote Open Education Week called Picture Yourself Open. Uh, you can see on the website that there's the opportunity for you to download some templates to color or to upload pictures of anything that features open or open education. Um, we're looking at this as a possibly as a contest to get more participation and to get wider circles of promotion. So we wanted some feedback on that from you. What do you think about running this as a contest, or do you have other ideas that we can use to kind of promote Open Education Week to new audiences and in different ways. Looks like we have somebody typing in an idea, but if you have any ideas or suggestions or feedback or comments on how do we really get Open Education Week as widely looked at as possible. We'd love to hear from you. Yes, thank you, Igo. Absolutely. We'd love to hear um, any feedback you have on Open Education Week, how to promote it, what are the best things uh, for us to be featuring in Open Education Week. Um, 
We'd love to have more collaboration with student organizations. Yes, thank you, James. Um, but Igor's point is that you can give us feedback on it at any time at info at openeducationweek.org. Um, that email is, is monitored, and, and we'll get right back to you. All right, it looks like we have some strong interest in collaborating with students. I wonder what the best way to do that is. Does anyone have any particular ideas? Great, James, you're right. I think reaching out to your local student associations is great. And we will be hearing from Jennifer very shortly on the work that she's doing with uh, adult basic education and reaching adult learners. Oh, interesting, an app that would push OE notifications. Hmm, that could be very interesting as well. Um, so great, we'll, we'll pull these together in a list and, uh, and get them out to the planning committee as well. and. Um, and maybe get back to some of you individually for uh, further ideas on this. Uh, so let's move on to our year in review um, so that you can hear some of the things that we were up to this year. It was a pretty busy and exciting year for us, 2015. The infographic we put together, you see a high level snapshot of it here, is available on the website. We're also going to have it available in PDF form in case you want to send it out to greater people. But we wanted to take the chance to go over it uh, slide by slide here so that you can have a closer idea of what we were up to. Um, some of you got a quick preview of it last week as a sneak peek, but we're really really just announcing it this morning to get it out to the community. So we, uh, are, we conceptualize this as a journey, and we wanted to take you through the journey of 2015 in open education. Uh, starting with Open Education Week last year, as you can see, we had some pretty interesting statistics here. There were 130 events organized around the world that got featured on the event calendar. Um, we hope that that will be higher again this year. We had 20 different languages for events. Um, and we had over 4 million Twitter impressions, which means those, that's the reach of all of the tweets during Open Education Week, which is really impressive for a five-day event um, that was really community organized and community sponsored. We also had a great time in Banff. For those of you who joined us there, we were so happy to see you. For those of you who didn't, we hope to see you in Poland this year. Um, so our conference, our global conference, was in Banff last year in Canada. We had 83 different presentations from 37 different countries. So the conference was really international, very strong representation from around the world, uh, a beautiful setting, a really excited audience. I think some of the presentations I heard from People who attended, they were the highest quality presentations that they had heard at any open education conference. People are doing really interesting things. They're happy to share. They're excited to make those collaborations. And we were really happy that those connections were happening at our conference. So we hope to see more of them this year. Um, and we hope to see you again in Poland. We also did a number of member and community service projects. We went over a lot of these during these community meetings last year. So you're probably already familiar with these. If you're not, uh, please visit the infographic on our website and click through to the pages. But we wanted to spend a little more time talking about some of the projects and activities you may not have been as familiar with. We did some really interesting work this year, including work with the Campus Virtual de las Americas, which is a collaboration with the Organization of American States. And their goal is to make quality education accessible to everybody in the Americas. So they're working with a selected group of institutions and organizations uh, to come together and put a portal that will um, make a virtual hub for the Americas, for learning in the Americas. And they've asked us to take on the open education component. So uh, Marcela Morales, who's our staff member in Mexico, has been working on this a lot this year. Um, curating OER, providing general information about o open education, and doing a lot of work on the administration and design of this site. So as you can see, it's a really interesting portal that's just taking off now, uh, and we hope will take off uh, significantly in the future. 
This year we also started uh, consulting as some, to diversify some of our activities. One of our first and most major projects that we took on was the e-learning pioneer. This was a program uh, to share best practices in e-learning and open education, specifically for female faculty members in Saudi Arabia. This uh, program was sponsored by the Ministry of Education and the National uh, e-learning Center for I'm sorry, Center for E-Learning and Distance Learning in Saudi Arabia. Their logo seems to have disappeared. I guess the price of gas has dropped enough that they can't afford to keep their logo anymore. Um, but anyway, we, we partnered with uh, some really excellent organizations to make this project happen, including the Online Learning Consortium, Quality Matters. And you see the names of the universities at the bottom, UMass, Tufts University, College of the Canyons, University of California, Irvine, and the University of New Hampshire who hosted practicum placements for these pioneers. So to give you a little more idea of what this program involved, um, there were 40 pioneers, all female faculty, from across Saudi Arabia, coming from 13 different universities. Uh, it's an 11-month program. It started last February. Technically ended at the end of December, but we're still in the phases of wrapping it up now. We offered 178 hours of online workshops and webinars, and this was in e-learning and, um, and open education. There were two weeks of practicum placements in the US, again, at those great universities that hosted the, the uh, faculty members, followed by a week of workshops. During that time, they met with 154 US faculty and administrators. So this gives you an idea of the breadth and the depth of the, of the program. They had 220 hours of trainings and meetings while they were in the US. So it was really intensive. Um, and we, this gives you an idea of the arc of the program. Our arrow seems to have disappeared. But imagine an arrow going from the lower left up to the upper right. And it gives you an idea at the top of the goals of the different phases of the program, and at the bottom, the activities that we put together to make that happen. So overall, um, a really intensive uh, a year-long program that, again, we're just wrapping up now with the evaluations, but it's been really successful and we've had a great, um, a great opportunity to connect with Saudi faculty that we probably not, would have not otherwise had to meet and get them really interested in open education. The other project that we wanted to highlight was uh, Marshall McLuhan. And if you're familiar with Marshall McLuhan, you're going to be really excited about this site. And if you're not familiar, uh, you'll get to know him through this site. This is the uh, uh, McLuhan Speaks Pest Special Collection. Um, we worked with them to put a first primary source video up there with the transcripts. And the transcripts are completely open. They're openly licensed so that you can use them in your educational endeavors. This site explains his ideas in his own words. So things that you're familiar with, like the global village or um, the medium is the message, he explains these in his own words. So it's your opportunity to really dig into what he meant and to see how you know, his views on communication and technology in the 60s really parallel the developments of the internet and communications today. So we were really happy to work with the McLuhan family to make this happen and to turn it into an open resource. We also wanted to call attention to the diversity of presentations and the geographic spread that we were able to reach with advocacy and awareness raising. This is a map of all the presentations and workshops and seminars that were given by staff and board members this year. Uh, you can see we managed to go everywhere except Antarctica. And if you're really interested in what these uh, conferences and presentations were, here's a list of all of the conferences and events uh, where we made presentations or gave seminars or workshops or trainings. So we really managed to cover a great deal of the world this year, and we were uh, very happy that people were interested enough to keep inviting us back. Uh, and of course, we wanted to thank you um, and our members and our sustaining members, because it's really the community that's making open education become more mainstream, become more well-known. And uh, you deserve a lot of credit for all the work you did in 2015. So we wanted to say a special thank you to you. We also wanted now to introduce um, our guests for the meeting so that you can hear about a couple of really exciting projects that are happening. First, we have uh, design, Designers for Learning. This is uh, Jennifer, sorry, Jennifer Madrell, who will give us an overview of the MOOC that she's working on to develop OER for basic adult education that benefits adults without a high school diploma. So Jennifer. Great. I do. Thank you. You can hear me OK? 
Okay. Um, yeah, I think I have a couple slides. If um, if you want to advance them, um, uh, that would be great. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, our project that we're working on right now, um, I represent Designers for Learning. It's a 501c3 nonprofit in the United States. Um, we're pretty new. We were founded about 18 months ago, and our mission is service learning. And um, we're, we were founded by a group of instructional designers, and our mission is to find social causes that could benefit from our expertise in instructional design, and particularly to coordinate projects to uh, bring in instructional designers, instructional design students, or other educators who are interested in pounding away on creating curriculum for, as I mentioned, a social cause. And so our current project that we're working on is to um, deliver a service MOOC. Um, it's going to be on the Canvas Network platform starting February 22nd, and it'll run 12 weeks until May 15th. And the focus is project-based. So all the enrollees of the MOOC will, um, will join in on um, collaboratively designing OER specifically for adult basic education um, and the educators and learners um, who unfortunately have uh, progressed through life and dropped out and uh, did not achieve their high, sp high school diplomas or other high school equivalency credentials. And so if you're interested in this, um, if you want to work, if you want to see what we're all about, um, you can check out our website, obviously, which is designersforlearning.org. Uh, but then if you'd like to enroll in the course, if you head over to, um, to the canvas.net um, MOOC platform, you can see the information there on the slide of, of how to enroll in a course. Um, let's just move ahead, and then I'll give a little sense of, of what the, um, sorry, I think I double click there. Uh, we'll give you a sense for what the MOOC is all about. So here's the kind of the frequently asked questions about it. Um, as I mentioned, it's a project that, um, that we're supporting at Designers for Learning. But what's really important, and I, we have a couple folks in the chat room right now. J.R. Dingwall is one of the designers on the team. I see Alexa's name is there. She was a prior volunteer. Everyone who works with us on this project uh, is a volunteer. We are not funded uh, for this project. So this is, we're kind of the little engine that could. Just <laughs> We had a vision. We have an idea. And, um, and, and we just went, away, went at it to design the course and to work with the great partners, as I mentioned, Canvas.net. And I, I, there was another logo on there, OER Commons. That's where our resources will reside once, um, once the MOOC participants design the, um, the, the learning modules. And so we are estimating at this point our volunteers um, who have helped design the, the MOOC, as well as those that will be engaged in volunteers to facilitate the MOOC. Um, we'll be contributing about 1,000 volunteer hours. So literally no money has exchanged hands in any of this endeavor. We don't have funding from anyone, and I'm not paying anyone to work with us. Uh, so it's a very grassroots, homegrown effort, and um, it, it's probably the most rewarding and amazing thing I've, I've worked on in my career so far. Um, and hopefully that will continue on as, as the MOOC participants continue to pay it forward, um, creating these resources for, for the adult basic educators. So in terms of the focus, what the people in the MOOC will be designing, um, the focus is on the college and career readiness standards here in the United States. So the sub subject matter is English language arts and literature as well as math. Um, again, it's an adult basic education audience. So if you kind of think of the equivalent, it would be like the equivalent of K-12 um, uh, material, so from grade 1 through 12. Uh, we're targeting short bites of OER, so um, what that means, we're, we're time on task for the learner would be approximately 15 to 30 minutes, and the idea would be um, these are like lesson plans that uh, the adult educator would, would download, the materials would be there, the guidance in terms of how to use the lesson will be pre pre presented to them, and, um, and, and then away they go. Um, in terms of um, logistics for the course, I think that may have gotten cut off on our slide. Uh, the, the MOOC is a 12-week MOOC. Um, we are asking people to devote two to three hours a week um, to get a, a meaningful experience out of it. Um, and, and clearly, like, like every MOOC, we know we're going to have a, a huge amount of attrition. People will come in, poke around, and, um, and, and get what they like out of it and leave. But we're really hoping to get, um, you know, maybe, you never know targets, but we're really hoping that from this first iteration we can get maybe 60 quality um, OER resources that we can then contribute to the OER Commons and put it up there as um, kind of the first installment of adult education uh, resources. Um, and just before um, I, I kind of conclude my thoughts, I, I did want to um, make, make mention of this. When I talked to Mina 
about um, participating today, and I really want to thank you for the opportunity to do this. Uh, she mentioned in her email that it's, what, what's unique and in, interesting is the uh, focus and the attention on alt, adult ed, and unfortunately, it really is the forgotten education segment. Um, it's, it's really globally, it's a, it's a huge problem, obviously, seven, the numbers I'm pulling here are from UNESCO and um, OECD, as well as the U.S. Census Bureau, but um, it, it's just uh, a shame that there are millions and millions of uh, folks globally, as well as in the United States, who either cannot read at a very basic level, um, or to have not progressed to the point of having any type of credentials, which obviously are needed when you go to college or to um, expand your career. And so that's our focus. That's why we picked this as our um, as our mission. And um, I think hopefully JR has been uh, populating the chat room for me. I have a hard time talking and, and posting at the same time. But if you are interested in what we're doing, as I mentioned, take a peek at our website. Um, take a look over at canvas.net. And um, as we progress, if you hop over to OER Commons when this concludes, hopefully you'll see some uh, well-vetted resources for people to be able to use and adapt elsewhere. Did you want me to take any questions now, or did you um, did you want me to wait to the end? Okay, James has a question. Um, this is a terrific idea. Uh, in what way is the class content focused on adult basic education? Oh, that's a great question. So the MOOC itself is uh, an instructional design MOOC. So our fo focus really is kind of a pay it forward um, deal within the MOOC. So the people who will be, be enrolling in the MOOC are adult educators. They might be instructional designers. They might be people who are just interested in this in general. And they will actually be then creating the adult educational resources for um, for instructors as well as learners. And so the content within the MOOC is not necessarily adult basic education content. The uh, the product, the, the project-based course, um, the project of the course is where the adult basic education focus comes from. I see some folks typing. So what, as, the, as maybe some questions are coming in, I could maybe mention a few other things. The approach we're taking from an instructional design standpoint, as I said, it's a 12-week 12 uh, 12 experience. And so we're going through a basic instructional design cycle, uh, kind of the analysis phase, um, going through to looking at the learners, uh, the adult learner population, as well as what the career and college readiness standards are. JR, who I mentioned, is um, thank you again, JR, for populating things in the chat room. He's actually um, done a wonderful module on OER and uh, Creative Commons licensing and um, giving the, the MOOC participants an understanding of this whole world that unfortunately a lot of folks are not aware of. And uh, from there then students in the, in the MOOC will then have uh, the opportunity to do a written design plan, do a prototype of their learning materials which will go through a round of formative evaluation, and then finally they'll uh, present their materials to be published on OER Commons. And uh, James, yeah, so the licenses uh, at the end, everything that will go on OER Commons will be um, a Creative Commons license. They do have a little bit of flexibility. We are hoping everyone will just do a, a CC BY, uh, but certainly they have the ability within OER Commons to restrict it to non-commercial or whatever it may be. But um, the encouragement is uh, CC BY. Okay, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today.
Oh, I see we have another question from Alexa. That's a great question. Alexa's asking for the finished product, what does the technology, um, could it be used? It, it's wide open. Um, the way we've structured it, the thing that you will be posting within OER Commons is basically a, a Google Docs, um, and uh, you have the ability then to embed or to link to other resources that you've created. So if you want to use some other authoring platform to do some more robust development, that, that's fine as long as then we're able to link from that within OER Commons. So there's the what kind of the what, world is open in terms of uh, what you choose to use as your development platform for the resource. Great. Okay. So let's move on to uh, to Thomas. Again, he's here to talk about the Opportunity Education Project which is focusing on easy access and equal opportunity in education. So, Thomas, would you like to take over? Yes, thank you. Yes, my name is Thomas Pils. I'm from Germany. And I'm quite happy to have the opportunity to introduce our project, or at least a part of the project here. Uh, can everyone hear me OK? Well, seems to be OK. Good. The Opportunity in Education project was inspired um, by teachers and pupils we were in touch with developing technical solutions in order to better their open source LMSs like Moodle and, and other things. And uh, we are software developers. We're looking at um, not what we can produce and code, but what actually the end user, the learner or the teacher is requiring. We don't believe in these one-size-fits-all, uh, ready, out-of-the-box kind of uh, learning uh, technology, simply because it doesn't work. Every one of us uh, learns in a different way. Um, and so the technology should support this. And one of the, the aspects we have in this is uh, that, especially where I'm from, in Germany, um, there's this uh, Moodle, is, uh, for instance, an LMS, which is quite popular. It's popular simply because uh, this is what the federal government supports with um, uh, server facilities and updates and administration, things like this. So what teachers um, were asking for is an opportunity to swap content from an LMS to an LMS, rather than rebuilding open source courses with a PDF from here, a PowerPoint from there, simply because it is uh, taking too much time, or um, also, to be honest, uh, they don't simply know sometimes how to operate the systems. So what was required is how to free content from a Moodle, or from an Open OLAT, or from any other LMS, and have it swapped through a content hub to another LMS, without retyping, just flicking a button, uh, clicking a few things, and have a course which is made in Moodle, run in an open OLED platform, for instance. And the end result should be that people from anywhere with any type of LMS can work the same course. Not at the same time. Of course, it is always uh, native in their platform. But they can use a course which is created in Moodle uh, in Australia or in the US, and they can use it. And, and take it just into their Unite Open OLED or even a Canvas or whatever the, the LMS uh, might be and run it there. So that is the requirement. That is what we're developing in the moment. And we have uh, one piece of technology we're using for it, just for those uh, that are interested in technology, we're using the Experience API. Um, it's also called X. API um, for American users probably it's more popular under the uh, name Tin Can, yeah, which was the original project name during development, but the official name of the technology is Experience API. Simply because the Experience API is the perfect means to transport and store data, not only learning data, data in general. And with uh, learning data, we can push from left to right. We can also um, push content from left to right. And for this technology, a lot of people know SCORM. Um, quite often it's said X API will be the successor of SCORM. It's probably not, but uh, it allows for a lot more um, things to be done. Uh, it's mobile. It's uh, not dependent on the platform. Uh, all these kind of things which are um, with SCORM a hindrance. 
Um, and in order to make SCORM content um, basically fit for the 21st century, um, layers and wrappers are used, which are powered by the XIPA. And in the same way, we use this. We use this um, in order to swap complete content pieces from a native Moodle to a complete different, let's say, Open OLED or customized live ray platform. So that teachers can just pick and choose in their language. This is a good physics or biologic or mathematics course, uh, rather than taking the time to do this and reinvent the wheel myself and just pull this course in, make it available to the students, collect with my native functionalities of my um, LMS um, or the learning records I need for assessments and done with it. So the idea is with this practically to do something what we do already in one project. And we picked that project in particular to support teachers which create um, learning courses through museum guides. These are seven EU countries, eight schools from seven EU countries that work in museums to bring museums into school to get peop um, pupils more interested into art but also to get traditional subjects from school into a museum. Thinking of Leonardo da Vinci, you can think of him as an artist, but you can think of him also as a physicist, uh, as a chemist, as uh, plenty of things. And um, in order to make this, out of this Erasmus um, Europe sponsored project, more global, we thought, okay, we don't just produce one platform where these eight school benefit, we create in addition to this, standalone versions of that, so that other schools which think this is a good didactical concept can just adopt it, install a Moodle, and just jump in, borrow content from this program, or um, supply content to that program. That would work on a Moodle basis, actually quite uh, simple, that's not that uh, difficult to do this, uh, to push content from Moodle to Moodle, but we have a um, very diverse world. Not everyone is using Moodle. And in order to make this then happen to, or with an exchange through a content hub with any LMS, that is what we are currently working on. That is part of our global project opportunity in education. And that is where we're actually looking for participation. Anyone who is interested in um, either contributing to the development or running a pilot project, uh, to connect to pilot projects that use the Central Content Hub. Um, the more the merrier, the more different the LMSs are, uh, the better, simply because we still have to fine tune. We know many of them, but we don't know all, and we don't know all the customizations people might have done uh, to their installs, so that we can cater for these things. The more people contribute and the more people uh, get dug in into this kind of um, technology, uh, liking to use this. Um, we are very open for this. We are starting with pilot projects from March this year all the way through the end uh, of uh, 2016. And looking, oops, got too fast. Uh, and looking then to uh, release the technology um, as open source um, to the market and to anyone who actually cares um, by Gen December this year, January next year. Any questions to this? Um, is this an EU project? No, this is not an EU project. Um, the project came about um, actually with a call for participation from the German government. But as efficient as we Germans are with some things, the slow we are, especially when it is uh, policy makers and decision makers, uh, we made that suggestion to uh, German school authorities and the German government. And they were all like, well, well yeah, um, we have a lot of issues with this um, to fit this somehow in our civil servant schedule. Uh, so we said, OK, fine. Uh, at the time while you're thinking, we just start this. So we have uh, collaboration with uh, Austrian universities, Dutch universities. Uh, we are in the Middle East. We have a base which we are setting up now in Dubai. Uh, simply because we said that this approach, after we introduced it to many people, 
uh, was uh, taken on uh, very friendly by many people and we said good uh, that is something we actually going out to say we change a bit of the way technology works for e-learning and e learning in general in order also then to promote open educational resources um, and present this as a project for the Expo 2020 in Dubai. So it's in the moment a private initiative from our company with a lot of people supporting it as sponsors or as participants in pilot projects, but it's not an EU or public or any way funded project at this stage. Um, German government funding, presumably at some point, um, yeah, well, uh, it's a bit of a Christmas list kind of, uh, wish list kind of thing. Um, we're not really sure if we want German government funding at this point, simply because uh, if it is federal government, then um, they just put the label on it uh, with, um, it's kindly sponsored. Uh, by Ministry X or that and then to get funds is really hard and going through the different federal states and all the different uh, rules is, is another problem. Um, also, it slows us down. So in the moment we're looking more into um, because where we're actually coming from is um, how to support and how to really bring lifelong learning yeah, um, on the road and how to get lifelong learning documented. Yeah, electronically and certified and verifiably documented. And there is a lot of business interested in, in these kind of things. And we basically go out and, and try to encourage businesses to say, listen, the better the kids come from school and the more qualified students come from universities, the better work material you have for your workforce. So it's you, in the end of the day, beside the actual learner, who benefit the most, simply because it saves you a lot of money. So invest some of that money into this development. So this is, in the moment, the, the approach we're taking. It's not a business model as such, in the end of the day. Uh, we are just inventing a few things and try to see how many people we can encourage to join in. Yeah, to change the way technology is used in e-learning. Yeah, thank you. Does make sense. To get a bit more about the idea of what we do, probably a visit to that website, Opportunity Education. Um, is uh, is a good idea because the central content hub for this LMS thing is just one small piece of um, what this project uh, is about. Great, thank you very much, Thomas. Again, we'll have more opportunity for questions at the end of the meeting. But uh, we also wanted to let you know that if you are interested in learning more about the project, Thomas uh, and his company are one of the sponsors of our conference this year in Poland, and they will be having a presentation there about this project. And of course, then you'll have the opportunity to socialize with him and learn more about it. So please, uh, if you're coming to Poland, and we hope you are, that you'll have the opportunity to join his session and meet him in person. So thank you very much to both Jennifer and Thomas uh, for updating us on your really, really interesting project. Um, we wanted to thank you. talk hmm. with all of you a little more about um, the 10 year anniversary of the Cape Town Declaration. So as most of you know, uh, 10 years ago almost, in September of 2007, this declaration was written by some of the four thought, uh, the, the foremost thinkers in open education at the time who got together in Cape Town uh, and put out a declaration of what open education uh, is, what it should be, and what we were supporting in a new way of approaching and thinking about education and, and how uh, education should be constructed. So this was a meeting was sponsored by the Shuttleworth Foundation and the Open Society Foundations. And we are working with those two organizations to plan the global celebration of the Cape Town Declaration next year. And although we haven't made a big announcement about it yet, we can let you know that our conference, the Open Education Global Conference, will take place in Cape Town in 2017 in March. 
which is why we really want to make sure we have uh, an extra strong uh, celebration of the Cape Town Declaration that can be done in Cape Town at our conference a year from now. So we wanted to ask you guys to first solicit your ideas. This is the very beginning of the planning period for the celebration of the Cape Town Declaration. So really wanted to hear from you. What do you think we should do to mark uh, the Cape Town Declaration 10-year anniversary? At the same time, we should mention that it is the five-year anniversary of the Paris Declaration. And Davor, who's on this call, has let us know that um, in celebration of that, the second meeting of the global community around OER and open education in UNESCO, so this is the policy maker level, um, will happen in Slovenia sometime in either 2017 or 2018. And they're also at the very beginning of this. So through the 10-year celebration of the Cape Town Declaration and the five-year celebration of the Paris Declaration, followed by the second World Congress on OER that will take place in Slovenia, we have this fantastic opportunity in the next uh, year to really focus on open education at all levels, policymakers, learners, administrators, educators. How should we do this? How can we kick this off with a celebration of the Cape Town Declaration? So welcome your ideas, please. Before and after analyses. Um, yeah, so actually, Davor, thank you for bringing that up. The uh, Mozilla Foundation, Mark Sermon, who was a Shuttleworth Fellow at the time of the Cape Town Declaration, was written, and he was one of the main authors. Uh, he's now the head of the Mozilla Foundation. And they are going to commission a report along with Shuttleworth and the Open Society Foundations to survey those who were at the Cape Town Declaration meeting. Uh, 10 years ago and find out what they're doing now. So a 10-year kind of retrospective on what people are doing, what people have done in open education. So um, what other kinds of analyses were you thinking of, Davor? Or anyone else, if you have ideas for the celebration, for markers, for studies, things that we should be doing um, that we want to get the planning started for now. Please go ahead, throw them out, brainstorm, doesn't matter how crazy they are. That's great. So a gathering of statistics on OER, including policies, laws, high-level things, uh, global impact. So that's interesting. I know we've tried to, many people have tried to assess the impact of open education on learners through doing um, a look at success rate in courses that incorporate OER, for example. But I don't think that's really been done on a global level. That's really been done on an institution to institution level. All right, I'm going to propose that um, if you're interested in working on this and to figuring out what the celebration should look like and what kinds of studies maybe we should do or events that we should hold in celebration of the declaration or what we should be doing about it at our conference next year, please email us at feedback at oeconsortium.org. We'll put together a committee um, to start looking at this. If we're going to do things like what Davor is suggesting, which I think we can all agree would be really helpful if we had some global statistics and great infographics to share about the impact of open education to mark the 10-year anniversary. 
Uh, if we could do that, it's going to take some planning and some work. So we need people to help us uh, figure that out in the next few months. So please, if you're interested in helping us with that, uh, get, get back to us at feedback at oeconsortium.org, and we will put you on the committee. Um, OK, so the next thing we wanted to quickly go over was the Open Education Awards for Excellence. This is an opportunity for us to recognize those people in the open education community who are doing great things. And we have um, a number of different categories that, that people can be nominated for. We have individual categories. We also have organizational categories. So there's a leadership category. There's educator categories for individuals an outstanding open education site, an outstanding course, an open MOOC, open research, creative innovation. We're also willing to look at other categories. So if we've missed a category that you think is really important in open education that we should recognize, get in touch with the committee and let us know. This is the uh, area on the website. It's under projects on our website, the Open Ed Education Awards for Excellence. If you know someone who you think would be an excellent candidate, in the individual category or an organization or a website that should be nominated for special recognition, please go to our website, read over the criteria, and submit your nomination. It's pretty straightforward. The information on there is quite basic um, to let us know what's happening and why you think they should be considered. Then our committee or our board of directors will take a look at that next month and make decisions. These awards uh, will be presented at our conference, which I've mentioned a few times, in Poland. The early registration for that ends on February 10th, so you've got a few more weeks to register if you want the early bird rate. The website for that is conference at oeconsortium.org. The deadline for the, open ed, uh, the Award for Excellence in Open Education is January 29th, so you have about another week to get those nominations in, and we would love to see some global um, recognitions happening at our conference this year. So finally, we wanted to leave the last 15 minutes or so for your questions, comments, discussion items, other things that you would like feedback on or, or that you have, um, or that you would like to, us to know about what you're working on in open education. You all have the opportunity to have a microphone, so if you'd like to speak, um, just let us know. We'd be happy to uh, make sure you're um, called on. And if not, we also have the chat window open. So please, any questions, comments, or discussion items? So Davar is saying you're pushing for applications. Davar, are you looking for people to collaborate with you on a project? I'm not sure what you mean by push for applications. OK, great. So if you're interested in uh, applying for a European Commission grant on uh, learning technologies, technology for learning and skills, or gaming and gamification, uh, Davor is interested in finding partners to work on that, those applications with him. So um, if you don't have Davor's email address, feel free to get in touch with us, and we'll be happy to, to link you up.
Uh, I guess, Una, we should probably clarify that the European Commission grants will only give money to people in the European Union, but I'm sure Davo would be happy to have collaboration from people anywhere in the world to give ideas and to help out. Great. So, Davo, it looks like you've got a few people who are interested in working on that with you. All right, does anybody else have comments, questions, or discussion items that they want to bring up? Again, you're welcome to use the chat window or microphone, whichever you're more comfortable with. Yes, thanks, Alexa. We are recording the webinar, and we will make the link available on our site where you signed up for uh, to participate in the meeting today. You'll find links to all of our past meetings, the recordings from those, and we'll put the recording for this meeting up there as well. And on that note, I think we'll stop the recording unless someone else wants to take the microphone. <laughs>